ಸುತ ಕಂಸಚಾಣೋರಮರ್ದನ ದೇವಕೀ ಪರಮಂದ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ವಂದೇ ಜಗದ್ಗುರು ಸೊ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಸ್ಟಡಿಂಗ್ ದ ಭಗವದ್ಗೀತಾ ಥರ್ಟೀನ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಬಿಗನ್ ದಿ ವರ್ಸಸ್ ಒನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಟು and we stop there um, we're going to stop and explore this a little more uh, i said that adi shankara acharya has written an extensive commentary on the second verse of the 13th chapter his largest longest commentary in the whole bhagavad gita it's actually an uh, inquiry into what is advaita vedanta really so we'll chant these two verses again and then we'll continue with the discussion ಶ್ರೀ ಭಗವಾನುವಾಚ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ರಿಪೀಟ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಭಗವಾನುವಾಚ ಇದ ಶರೀರ ಕೌಂತೇಯ ಇದ ಶರೀರ ಕೌಂತೇಯ ಕ್ಷೇತ್ರ ಕ್ಷೇತ್ರ ಏತೋ ವೇತ್ತಿ ಪ್ರಾಹು ಏತೋ ವೇತ್ತಿ ಪ್ರಾಹು ಕ್ಷೇತ್ರ ತದ್ವಿದ ಕ್ಷೇತ್ರ ತದ್ವಿದ ಕ್ಷೇತ್ರ ಚಾಪಿ ಮಾಂ ವಿಧಿ ಕ್ಷೇತ್ರ ಚಾಪಿ ಮಾಂ ವಿಧಿ ಸರ್ವಕ್ಷೇತ್ರು ಭಾರತ ಸರ್ವಕ್ಷೇತ್ರು ಭಾರತ ಕ್ಷೇತ್ರ ಕ್ಷೇತ್ರ ಜ್ಞಾನ ಕ್ಷೇತ್ರ ಕ್ಷೇತ್ರ ಜ್ಞಾನ ಯಜ್ಞಾನಂ ಮತ ಮಮ ಯಜ್ಞಾನ ಮತ ಮಮ ಹಿ ಸೇಸ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ಶ್ರೀಕೃಷ್ಣ ದ್ಯಾಟ್ ದೀಸ್ ಬಾಡೀಸ್ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಲೇಬಲ್ ದೆಮ್ ಫೀಲ್ಡ್ಸ್ ಕ್ಷೇತ್ರ ಫೀಲ್ಡ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದೋಸ್ ಹೂ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪೀರಿಯನ್ಸ್ ದೀಸ್ ಬಾಡೀಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ವಿದ್ ಇನ್ ಲೇಬಲ್ ದೆಮ್ ನೋವರ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಫೀಲ್ಡ್ ಕ್ಷೇತ್ರ Kshetra means field, Kshetra Gya, knowers of the field. And by saying this, he is making the distinction between field and field knower. He is making this most important insight, he is giving us this insight, we are not bodies. We have often discussed this, this is the first step in the Vedantic inquiry, that we are not bodies. The bodies are there, but we are not bodies. And we discussed how using... for example an inquiry like seer and see indrik drishya viveka we can come to an understanding we can grasp it for ourselves how in what sense am i not the body no, notice he is not saying that the body is not there body is there but i am not literally this body and that also applies to the mind there is a distinction between body mind and i am the witness consciousness of this now is this all that is to be known is this the final knowledge in the lead lead commentary to the second verse shankaracharya raises this question is that all i am not the body i am not the mind i am the witness consciousness that's a huge step forward by the way that's sankhya philosophy basically uh, in sankhya philosophy there is uh, this material nature the universe called prakriti the entire universe our biological bodies our psychological minds intellect buddhi all of that is nature it's not you and there is consciousness limitless consciousness each of us is a limitless consciousness uh-huh. called purusha there are many purushas many such beings we are all each of us is uh, such a being um and we the, the in the sankhyan um, paradigm the problem is that we have become confused yeah. see material nature and consciousness prakriti and purusha interact where do they interact they interact in these bodies in each of us we are basically interactions of matter and spirit of prakriti and purusha all of us right now but we are not combinations of matter and spirit we are spirit itself we are consciousness itself we are purusha and we somehow we don't know that and so what sankhya does is to teach us to separate these two in our understanding they are already separate 
but we are not seeing them separately. To see the separateness, the distinction of these two, and that's freedom according to Sankhya. What is bondage according to Sankhya? Mixing up consciousness and matter, subject and object. And what's freedom according to Sankhya? Separation. Vyoga. Yoga is Vyoga. Yoga literally means joining, but in Sankhya sense, it's separation. Um, because of this, so why is it a problem and what is it a solution? Why is separation a solution? It's a problem because all that happens in material nature, we take upon ourselves. Um, so birth and aging and illness and you know, physical suffering and eventual death and rebirth, all of that we take upon ourselves, the conscious being, because we think we are these bodies. And then anxiety and fear and unhappiness and desire and uh, frustration, all of these things which are um, characteristics of the mind, we take upon ourselves. Because we do not see the difference between ourselves and the mind. Uh, it's like being reflected. You, are, you see, you've forgotten your real face and you see yourself reflected in the mirror. And then the dust in the mirror, you think my face has become dusty or my face has become concave or convex or the mirror is cracked and my face has become cracked. No, it's the reflection in the mirror. Similarly, consciousness shining on the mind, whatever happens in the mind, you know, unhappiness, anger, misery, um, guilt, whatever is there in the mind, it's all you, we, uh, we own it and then we suffer. I can hear myself. <laughs> It's material nature. <laughs> yes. Oh, somebody's watching live stream and me also at the same time. <laughs> yes. It's, uh, that's an infinite feedback, feedback loop. So the separation, knowing yourself as pure consciousness and then working through the body-mind, then you're free of it. Because consciousness by itself is not born, it does not age, it does not die. The bodies do that. Consciousness does not become um, uh, unhappy or miserable. or uh, Even consciousness does not wake, dream or sleep. It is the mind which wakes, dreams and sleeps. So if you can separate these two and clearly see the distinction, even while you are operating the body-mind, you would be free. This is, but this is Sankhya. This is Sankhya. Advaita is a step forward, is, is further. In Advaita Vedanta, what happens? In the second verse, Krishna says that uh, oneness. It's not separation. After separating yourself, seeing the distinction between yourself and body-mind, then this pure consciousness itself, this witness consciousness itself, this is one in all bodies and minds. And this is that one in which the all bodies, minds and the universe appears in that. All knowers and the known, all subjects and objects, they appear in this ground, they, you know, we could call it Godhead, you call it Brahman, you call it um, the um, Absolute, the ground, whatever you call it. And that we are. So that is what Krishna says in the second verse. He goes further. Shankaracharya asks this question, is this enough to know the distinction between Kshetra and Kshetra? In other words, he's asking, is Sankhya enough? And he says, no, there's something more. And Krishna goes on to say something which is not accepted by Sankhya. There is one consciousness in all bodies and minds. Not one um, knower of the field in every field. No. Apparently so. But really, if you investigate the knower of the field, you will find that there is one knower of the field, ultimately. This is, uh, Sankhya does not agree with this. Sankhya says there are many consciousnesses. The one consciousness. Why one consciousness? Why not many consciousnesses? These debates, well, I mean, there are a lot of discussions on this. Further, all these fields and the world and every universe, they're all appearing in that consciousness. What do you mean appearing? They're not, see the, do you see the difference between appearing to and appearing in? I'll give you three statements. The universe appears to you, the consciousness. One. Two. The universe appears in you, the consciousness. Three, the, you, the consciousness, appear as your own universe. Three, I'll tell you the difference between them, point out the distinctions. When I say the universe appears to us, it means there's a distinct universe which is appearing to me. There's a universe and I'm experiencing it uh, because I'm conscious. 
That's one. And that most people wouldn't dispute. Yeah, that's more or less um, what's happening. But the second one is a big step forward, is that the universe appears in our consciousness. By in, I mean, just like a, the example would be a dream universe. Like the dream universe, we all, we all admit, dreams, whatever we saw in the dream, whoever we saw and whatever happened, the space, time, objects, people, events, all in the dream, they are all, it's not that they appeared to us, they appeared in us. We all agree. The entire dream universe was in the dreaming mind, in my mind. We agree? Like that, Advaita Vedanta is claiming, actually in the waking state also, this physical universe, it's not appearing to you, it's appearing in you. And then goes further. It's appearing in me, this universe is appearing in consciousness, what's this universe made of? If the dream world is appearing in the dreaming mind, then what's the dream world made of? Is it made of bricks and stones and water and air and fire and atoms and protons and superstrings? No. If it's appearing as a dream in our minds, it's made of mind. I'm not saying anything new. This is what we understand our dreams to be. Whatever our minds are, when we dream, whatever our minds are, our dreams are made of the mind. What's the stuff? When you say this is, table is made of wood, but if I dream of this table, would that table in the dream be made of wood? No. When we wake up, we'll realize it's just... Right now, for example, if I show you the book, you'll say, yeah, the book is made of uh, paper and cardboard and all that. But now close your eyes and visualize the book, which I just showed you. Right now, that visualization which we are doing, that visualized book, what is it made of? Is it actually made of paper? No, no, of course not. It's made of thought, of imagination. Similarly, if it is appearing in consciousness, the universe, then it must be made of consciousness. So that's the third statement. It's consciousness alone appearing to itself as its own universe. And that's Advaita. Why is it Advaita? Because there is no two anymore. Even while the universe is appearing, even when billions of people and billions of living beings and non-living entities, tables and chairs, quarks and quasars are appearing and disappearing to you, you can claim honestly there's only one thing. Consciousness alone, or Atman alone, or Brahman alone. That alone is there. That is non-duality. Because no second thing, even while you're experiencing the second, even when we are experiencing the other, no other exists because the other is you. This is oneness. This is non-duality. Swami Vivekananda was reading in that book, The Inspired Talks, right here in upstate New York on Thousand Island Park. Very inspiring, um, this uh, powerful non-dualistic statement he makes. He says, There is only one God, and that God is the... He coins a new term, knownest of all know that is known. <laughs> it is all that we ever see. But see, he means, I'm, ex I'm commenting on that, see, hear, smell, taste, touch, think, feel, enjoy, suffer. It is just that one. And then the next statement, he says, no living being, even animals, can deny the, the, the intuition of I am. The self exists. The existence of self cannot be denied by anybody. Now look at this. It seems like a whiplash. He's saying there's only one God that exists. The one true God that exists. Okay. All religions have said that. But the next he says it's the most known of all. That all religions have not said. God seems to be unknown. A matter of faith. He says not, not at all a matter of faith. Everything that we experience is this one divinity alone. It's the most known of all known things. But then what do you mean exactly it's the most known of all known things? What is the one thing which we cannot deny, which you are completely sure of all the time, that I am? So that, what is God? It is the most known of all things. Oh, how? It is everything that we see. See, hear, smell, whatever we experience. Oh, really? How so? He next, he says, it's you, the self. The knower of the field. And then further, he goes on to explain it. One more sentence, he says, the self alone is projected as all that we see. Or all that we experience is a projection of the self. 
it is the consciousness alone appearing as all therefore non dual this i'm saying non dual but this they they can't they didn't say it. and then he goes on to say that it is very simple teach it to children for they can understand it it's not a very uh, complex subtle argument it's actually the most direct of our it's so simple that we miss it all the time and that's the key and the so key to the mystery of this universe what is all this and what's happening and it's also the solution to all our problems a deep solution so this non duality what uh, krishna is saying here what shankaracharya is commenting upon vivekananda says this there and he goes on to say i mean this is not directly relevant but let me tell you what he says application of this he says it is this indecent clinging to life that is the source of all weakness all sin uh, all unhappiness indecent clinging to life he says <laughs> uh, he he says he goes on to say what can die when my life is in everything in the universe when even one being lives i am not dead even our minds cannot die when one being is thinking i am thinking because it's all an appearance in me the one consciousness and this is because of this clinging to life uh, that we want to live in this one little little body more and more and more he says it is nothing we do, we are not worried about the fall of one hair let this the fall of this one body is less than that <laughs> i'm paraphrasing a little bit here so um as you can see very deep uh, the most profound of all teachings this morning slightly changing the discussion this morning i had a conversation with a swami from uh, haridwar in the foothills of the himalayas he has come here uh, last year swami pranab chaitanya ji he gave a talk here you know i translated uh, from hindi to english so he called uh, it's possible he might be coming soon again so but he raised a question and he discussed a little bit uh, with me i'll share with you what he said he said consider the distinction in the idea of ignorance in advaita vedanta and sankhya i'll repeat again both of them claim ignorance is the problem and knowledge is the solution but what kind of ignorance ignorance about what the distinction what the nature of ignorance in sankhya what are we ignorant about and the nature of ignorance in advaita what are we ignorant about they are different what is the difference in sankhya the nature of the ignorance is we do not know that we are separate from material nature so the problems of material nature the problems the characteristics of the body we superimpose upon ourselves upon consciousness superimpose upon consciousness means that which belongs to the body we take it as ourselves tall short man woman uh, dark fair skin this is a body i take it upon myself young old body i take it upon myself healthy ill body i take it upon myself birth death body i take it upon myself instantaneously i don't have to sign a document for that i behave that way i think that way i feel that way that's because i take the body upon i don't see the distinction between myself so the ignorance regarding the distinction between consciousness and matter and even worse mind the characteristics of the mind i superimpose upon my misery anxiety fear terror waking dreaming sleeping all i superimpose upon myself i'm not even the mind not even the body not even the mind these are products of nature i do not see the distinction that is ignorance and when that ignorance is overcome by sankhya knowledge i realize myself as pure consciousness but clearly it still remains as a dualistic system consciousness and matter spirit and matter consciousness and object whereas he said in advaita vedanta what is the nature of maya what is the nature of ignorance avidya maya in advaita vedanta it is um, i'm translating what he said it is anirvachan you cannot say that it is you cannot say that it is not and it is entirely within consciousness 
projecting consciousness as this in display of this universe. So it is not just a confusion in the intellect, as it seems to be in Sankhya. Here it is a power of Brahman or Atman, which projects Brahman, existence, consciousness, bliss, as this entire universe. So Brahman itself appears as this universe. In Sankhya that's not true. In Sankhya you are not this universe. In fact you are distinct from this universe. That's the thing. Here it's the opposite. You are this universe. Mm -hmm. This universe. Our problem then in Advaita is that we identify ourselves with a slice of this universe. This little body mind. And then everybody else is an other. We do not know what we are. Immortal consciousness. Existence. And uh, we, we identify ourselves with what we are not, this body-mind. So when we remove ignorance in Advaita Vedanta, we arrive at non-duality. In Sankhya we arrive at duality, consciousness and matter. I am not this. In Advaita Vedanta we arrive at, I am the reality of all that exists. I am the one consciousness, I am the, in the one knower of the field in all fields, as, as uh, Krishna has said. In dualistic religions, we have this triangle, Ishwara, Jiva, Jagat. Ishwara, God, Jiva, sentient beings like us, Jagat, the world. What Krishna is saying here is, is dramatic. He is saying the truth, there is a truth to be understood about the world, about yourselves and yes, about me, God. What is that truth? We are all one existence consciousness, please, ultimately. Ultimately. That is what has been said now. And Shankaracharya in his commentary says, the real knowledge, Krishna says, this is knowledge according to me. And this is ultimate knowledge according to me. The ultimate knowledge is to know everything to the end. What is this world ultimately, really? What are we really? Not stopping halfway like Sankhya. And what is God? Sankhya doesn't even talk about God. So what is God really? Ishwara, Jiva, Jagat, these are ultimately one existence consciousness place. Not parts. There is only one, appearing as a world, appearing as many sentient beings, and appearing as the God of all of this. So this is, uh, uh, this is a dramatic difference. So the Swami was telling me, when you distinguish between Sankhya and Yoga on one hand, and Advaita on the other hand, uh, notice the difference in their understanding of ignorance. What is it that we are ignorant of? So the second verse, the first verse, Sankhya would be very happy with it. Field and knower of the field. See, see, you are the knower of the field, everything else is the field. The second verse, Sankhya would be uneasy with it. I am the knower in all fields. And these fields are also not distinct from the knower. Uh, how, uh, is that hasn't been mentioned, that's taken for granted because in Vedanta, Ishwara, the creator of this universe, the universe is not distinct from the creator of this universe. It's... Uh, Ishwara alone appears as this universe. Vedanta Sara, I will not explain, but those who are curious about what am I talking about? Ishwara, Saguna Brahman is the Abhinna Nimitta Upadana Karana of Jagat. What does it mean? The one uh, and undivided material cause, uh, instrumental and material cause of this universe. So this universe is nothing other than the divinity itself. So it's an immanent divinity in and through this entire universe. All right. But that's not our subject today. Our subject is the discussions. The, all this is very fine, but there are uh, huge objections. So multiple objections we studied last time, they have come. What are the objections? Quickly, four objections were um, set up against non-duality. The opponents, various philosophies. You can imagine Sankhya among them, Nyaya among them, other philosophies. They come forward, other darshana systems. They say, wait a minute. Uh, raining on your non-dual parade. <laughs> if you are saying, according to Krishna, Krishna has just said, Ishwara and Kshetragya, knower of the field and God, are one and the same. That means, either God becomes a sentient being like us. Problem. Because then God is no longer God. God becomes a jiva. Or in the words of Shankara, uh, the, the question is, is, God becomes a samsari. Ishwara becomes a samsari. Samsari is like us. We are propelled by our past karma, going from birth to birth. We, you know, we are whirled through samsara. If, 
Ishwara is like that, what good is? If then God is imperfect. God is no longer God then. It's imperfection. Or the other way around. There is no samsara in that case. We are all one with God. So God is always free. Ishwara is always free. So if you are all one with God, then we are not in samsara. We are free. We are free. There is no samsara. So there is no samsari. We are all one with God after all. There is no samsari. Nobody in samsara. Then samsara is not there. The problem itself has gone away. You say, what could be wrong with that? But the, what is wrong with that is then, uh, what are we doing here in that case? It seems to have no connection at all with reality. Third, if this is so, if we are all Ishwara, one with Ishwara, then what's the point of all these texts? Vedanta, Upanishads, all of these teachings, uh, they're all meant to deliver us from samsara, freedom from the cycle of birth and death, but you're already saying we are not samsari. Then what's the point? Then the, what is called Shastra Anarthakya, meaninglessness of the scripture would ensue. Third, third objection. These are all heavy duty objections. Enough to sink your ship of non-duality. And the fourth one, most dramatic, is it's completely against all means of perception, all means of knowledge. We can clearly see non-duality is not true. It's duality, dualism. Yeah. Samsara is real. We can see it. Uh, we, our um, sources of knowledge, our perceptions, our uh, um, you know, inference, all of them reveal samsara. How can you say samsara is not there? So these are the uh, objections. And Shankaracharya replies, last time we saw with a cryptic half sentence, he says, na, nope. Jnana, <laughs> jnana, yoho, anyatve, naupapattehe. So this I'm reading from Shankara's commentary. He says, this is all justifiable. So I can, exp you know, I can explain. <laughs> it's like you catch a kid with his hand in the cookie jar. And say, what are you doing? And so I can explain. <laughs> so Shankara says, I can explain. How can you explain? By the difference between knowledge and ignorance. Everything makes sense by the difference between knowledge and ignorance. What, does he, what do you mean? See, the scriptures. Yes, you are one with Brahman. You are Brahman, that's right. But it's no good as long as we are ignorant of the fact. And therefore the scriptures are useful. Even though you are Brahman, even though Krishna is right, he is, the, he is identical with all knowers of the field in all fields. That's true. But it's no use until we know it, until we realize it. Until we know this, that we are Brahman, Aham Brahmasmi, until we realize that, it's no use. And therefore the scriptures are useful. Why? Because there is ignorance of the fact. Now you see why the Swami's discussion about ignorance this morning, what I'm bringing in. What kind of ignorance is there in Ad Advaita talks about it and what kind of ignorance Sankhya talks about. This Advaita, the ignorance that Advaita talks about is, there is one underlying divinity and you are that, Tattvamasi, we don't know that, and that itself is appearing as this entire you. That we don't know. We need to know it. And therefore, Gita, Upanishads, Vedanta, all of that is useful. You see how the difference between knowledge and ignorance makes a case for the scripture. How does it end? You must be able to raise the question and answer it confidently. So Vedanta is useless because you say, if you claim you are Brahman, what, what use is Vedanta useful for Brahman? Said, no. But Vedanta is definitely useful for a sentient being in the condition of ignorance. Alright. What about Ishwara becoming a samsari or samsari becoming Ishwara? No, samsari and Ishwara are one and the same. In conditions of knowledge, you realize you are one with Brahman. And um, so in that case, are you not saying if if ultimately Ishwara and the samsari, the sentient being are equal, then Ishwara is no longer Ishwara. It is true ultimately. Ultimately, if I am no longer a jiva, in this entire world is, is an appearance, then how can the nature of God also remain untouched? Suppose, what is God after all? God is the creator, preserver, destroyer of this universe. God is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent and all of that. But now, suppose you say, some people criticize that Advaita Vedanta is saying that God is false. That is not true. What Advaita Vedanta is saying is Ishwaras Ishwaratva. The God the um, Godness, should I say? The controllerness. That is a superimposition. Actually, Ishwar is none other than Brahman, Nirguna Brahman. Just as you are Brahman, can Ishwara be any less? Can God be any less? God is also Brahman. After all, if that's not so, consider the, um, uh, the 
uh, alternative. Suppose you say, I am Brahman, Advaita is right, yes, I am Brahman, and the world is an appearance. Then what job has Ishwara got in that, in that circumstance? If the world disappears, if all sentient beings are one with Brahman, what is Ishwara creating, preserving, destroying? What is Ishwara controlling? Who is he giving karmas to? Nothing. The Ishwara's purpose of existence is gone then. It will be um, administering an uh, empty universe then. So Ishwara also is Brahman. So you make a distinction between what conveniently Advaita calls Paramarthika and Vyavaharika. The ultimate perspective and the relative perspective. In the relative perspective, yes. You have a world, you have people, and you have a God, and you have Vedanta. From the film's perspective, yes, there is Harry Potter, and there, there are villains, and there is but on the magic school. But from the perspective of the movie itself, it's a movie screen, and pictures are being projected to it. And both are true. Which is more true? The fact that it's a movie is more true. The, the fact that Harry Potter goes to a magic school is a part of a fictional universe. It's true in that universe, but that's not the ultimate truth. Similarly, um, so you see, this is how it makes sense. What about uh, our direct experience, this duality? Well, you have this duality in dreams also. In dreams also, it all seems to be I am going and meeting somebody and there is this world around me. And when I wake up, I realize I was sleeping. I can actually experience a world of duality even when it's not there. Today, of course, with virtual reality and all that, uh, it is more and more uh, easy to see how, it, how easy it is to fool our senses. When I go to the local library, I walk past, past this big apple shop. It's, it's very apt, you know, they have an apple shop in Big Apple. <laughs> <laughs> so they call it the Big Apple, Big Apple. And they make it in such a way, the whole thing is glass, so you can see what's happening inside. And nowadays they have, earlier they used to show laptops and things like that I could see. Now there's a whole range of, these glasses are there, there's... Uh, um, Apple Vision or something like that they call it. So it projects a whole um, uh, virtual world in front of you and which you, with which you can interact and do your work also. Similarly, in this case, in fact, um, there's this book, Untethered Soul. If you Google it, most popular book on meditation, I think, in the top of the lists, Untethered Soul. I forget the name of the author. Um, Anybody remember? Michael Singer. Singer. Michael Singer, yeah. So there he gives a very beautiful um, example. He says that um, imagine you've gone to a movie and it's very overwhelming. You know, a big screen and all that. It's very overwhelming. And you, you, you're sitting in darkness. So you can't see yourself. You're seeing the movie. How, how you get absorbed in the movie especially if it's a compelling plot. Now suppose it goes beyond that, no longer 2D, it's 3D. And like a virtual reality, all the characters are all around you. Not only is it 3D, with depth and all, yeah. you can see and hear, but now suppose you can touch, you can shake hands with somebody who's coming there. <laughs> yeah. And that's possible now. The, in, there's a place called MIT Media Labs, a lot of, mm, <laughs> in, it's in uh, Boston. So, they sh gave me a tour and some of the stuff that uh, that's going to come very soon into the market and all. I don't know if I'm supposed to talk about it. <laughs> so uh, haptic sensors, you can uh, actually, the gloves will help you to touch all the uh, virtual um, objects and shake hands with people who might be across the continent and so on. Um, so suppose you're not able to touch also. Now go a little further. You are able to smell. Uh, some movie theater did that, I uh, read about it. And that uh, when there's a flower and the character is smelling the flower, a little nozzle in your seat will squirt a little uh, uh, fragrance so you can smell it, what the character is smelling. And then suppose you can taste it also if you eat a virtual uh, um, uh, uh, samosa or something, you can taste it. <laughs> now, how real would that be? Now he goes, Michael Singer goes further. He says, not only that, but suppose this is a special, special movie theater where they can inject thoughts into your mind. They're no longer your thoughts. They're thoughts of the character. And they, in, in, they have a screen with shields of your memories. So now you are in the skin of the character. You're walking in that place 
interacting with whoever the character is interacting with, thinking the thoughts of that character, and they give you a whole set of memories of that character. What would it be like? Like this, like what we are right now. <laughs> right, right, like, right, what, what we are right now. Your pure consciousness presented with five senses, with a physical body, with objects of the senses, with form and light and sp uh, taste and smell and touch, heat and cold, uh, pain and pleasure, and with a mind which will give you thoughts, memories, tell you stories continuously, generate memories and all of that. And now you are, eh, here you are. <laughs> so that is, that's what's happening to us. We are superimposing all of that upon ourselves. Okay. Um, so, why, why did I say this? The objection was, but I am seeing it, how can it be an appearance? Well, because you are seeing it. In fact, another, let me add a little more. The objection is, how can you say that the world is an appearance? I am seeing it. Advaita Vedanta will say, exactly. If you are seeing it, it must be an appearance. <laughs> do you see the logic? What do you mean you are seeing it? It's an appearance in your consciousness. Or in you, the consciousness. Therefore, they have a, this is a simple argument, but it's rather confusing at first. Jagat mithya trishyatvat. The world is false. Why? Because you see it. <laughs> Anything that we see is an object, right? You say, okay, so, but the object is presented to consciousness. After all, you need consciousness to experience an object. You must be the knower of a field to experience the field. Okay, so. But is it presented to consciousness or in consciousness? If you listen carefully to what Greg Good said last Sunday, he, what he was trying to show is exactly that. It seems to be that the, the red ball, you see, there was a red ball which is presented to consciousness, but then you'll see there is no red ball apart from our conscious experience of the red ball. So the world, if you're seeing something, it's not presented to you, but it's presented in you, the consciousness. And if it is presented in you, the consciousness, it's an appearance in consciousness. Therefore, it's not a real, it's not an external independent reality apart from you. All right. What Shankaracharya says here is, all this is the problem of knowledge and ignorance. And to prove this, he gives a three-part uh, statement. One is, it's a traditional way of responding to anything in Vedanta. You have to quote from the Upanishads, Shruti. You have to quote from the Smriti, like Bhagavad Gita, and you have to reason it out. So what, is, what does he want to say? There's a dramatic difference caused by knowledge and ignorance. To, to uh, back that up, first he quotes from the Upanishads. He says, Duramete viparite vishuchi avidya yacha vidyeti jnata. Those who have studied Katha Upanishad, you'll remember this is a quotation from the Katha Upanishad. What does it mean? Vast and distinct are the paths of knowledge and ignorance. To, the, to you, the knower, knowledge and ignorance makes a huge difference. This is Kato Upanishad. Then Shankara goes on. Tathacha tayoho vidya vidya vishayoho phalavedo api viruddha nidhishta. The Upanishad, Shankara says, the Upanishads go on to show the results of knowledge and ignorance are distinct. You will get contradictory results from ignorance and from knowledge. Again, he quotes from Kato Upanishad. Shreyascha preyascha iti vidya vishaya. Shreyascha preyascha iti vidya vishaya. Shreya preyastu avidya karyam iti. Shreya and preya, these two terms were introduced in Kato Upanishad. Shreya means that which is auspicious, that which is beneficial, that is good for us. Preya means that which is pleasant. It's the path of karma, desire, trying to fulfill desires and engaging in karma and getting the results of karma, which may be good or bad, pleasant or unpleasant. It's called the way of the pleasant. The way of the good and the way of the pleasant. The way of the auspicious and the instinctive drive to fulfill our desires. And he says, these two are different. You attain the auspicious, which is enlightenment and freedom, through knowledge. He says, vidya vishaya shreya. The object uh, of knowledge is shreya, is the auspicious attainment of moksha, freedom. And then he says, prayas to avidya karyam. The, the product of ignorance is the world, is the way of karma. Uh, Priya means the pleasant. By doing, having desires, 
then striving to fulfill those desires, generating karma and the effects of karma, I'm trapped in samsara. So this he is getting from the Upanishads. And then he goes through a series of quotations of the Upanishads, which I'm not going to go through. The next step is to quote from the Smriti, another class of text, secondary to the Upanishads. So there he, a sampling of quotes, a couple of quotes, two or three quotes from the Gita itself. He says, Smritayascha, in the Smritis too we find, Agyane navritam jnanam tena muhyanti jantava, Gita, fifth verse of 15th chapter. No, this is the 15th verse of 5th chapter. By ignorance uh, is, uh, uh, are, are deluded uh, all, all sentient beings. The so Gita itself says, we are all deluded by sen- uh, ignorance. Ihaiva taijjita sargo yesham samyasthitam manaha. This is the 19th verse of the 5th chapter. Here itself you overcome um, the cycle of birth and death. Who overcomes? Those whose minds are centered in oneness. Samya means in evenness, in sameness. You see the same reality in the midst. It says here, here itself. Here means in the midst of tremendous diversity. You see the underlying oneness. They have overcome the cycle of birth and death. Clearly the knowledge of this underlying oneness takes you beyond samsara. Ignorance of this underlying oneness thrusts you into samsara. Gita says it, Krishna says it. Then next, 13th um, chapter, 28th verse. Samam pasyan hisarvatra samavasthitam ishwaram. So in this very chapter it will come later on. So those who see in all beings that one underlying divinity, which Krishna has said, I am the one knower in all beings, see, they will attain freedom. So again and again, it is to, to, something to be seen, to be, to be realized, to be known. Knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. That will rescue us from samsara, which is a product of ignorance. So again, the Smritis, the Gita itself says this. Next, an argument. Nyayatascha. And from reasoning also we have. Shankara says, let's reason about this. What are we reasoning about? What are we talking about? What are we quoting? The difference between knowledge and ignorance. He wants to say it's all your questions will be, will be answered if you see it as a difference between knowledge and ignorance. The reasoning is this. Sarpan kushagrani tatho dopanam gyatva manusya parivajayanti agyanat agyanatas tatra patanti kechit gyane phalam pasya tatha vishishtam. So he's quoting from the Mahabharata, but uh, this is an argument here. Snakes, uh, wells, kushagra, that means the, the, these grass which has very sharp tips. So if you walk with bare feet or touch them with your bare hands, you might get a nasty little cut. Knowing the presence of a snake or, a, or an open well or that this is sharp grass, what do, they do, what do people do? Manushya parivarjayanti. People carefully avoid those areas. And agyanata tata patanti kechit. But those, some people who don't know about it, who are ignorant about it, there's an open well there or there's a poisonous snake there or uh, there's sharp grass there. What happens? They fall into that and they get hurt. What's your point? He says, Phalam pasya tatha vishishtam Jnane phalam pasya tatha vishishtam Note the distinctive result, the benefit of knowledge. This is the argument he is making. Alright. Now we might say, I understand the point about snakes and wells and sharp grass, but we are not talking about that. We are talking about samsara and consciousness and Brahman and you know field and knower of the field. What are you trying to demonstrate? So Shankaracharya next he says, how ignorance causes all this samsara and knowledge solves all of this problem. He is now explaining. Tathacha, to explain further. Dehadishu atma buddhi avidwan raga dveshadi prayuktaha dharma dharma nushthanakrit jayate mriyate chayati avagamyate. We understand that avidwan, the uh, ignorant one, the one who does not know the, the truth of Vedanta. What happens? Dehadishu atma buddhi has the feeling that the body, etc., are the self. I am this body. What's this body? I. What are you? This. 
and adi means etc what's etc senses and mind and um, ideas and personality i am this body mind complex then what happens raga dvesha adi prayukta impelled by uh, strong likes and dislikes the moment i am the body mind i am bound to have preferences and dislikes i'm bound to want some things and be afraid of other things the moment i am this body you can't help it you can be brave about it you can exercise self control about it but as long as you feel you are this you will be affected so raga dvesha adi prayukta propelled by desires likes and dislikes attractions and repulsions what do we do dharma dharma anushthana krit this ignorant one performs dharma and adharma moral and immoral actions basically does things in the world engages in action as an agent of actions does things if the person is wise within the limits of ethics within the limits of morality tries to do the decent thing in the pursuit of the worldly goals and remember these worldly goals according to shankar are all based on ignorance they are all a product of delusion i need food to survive no you don't what do you mean swami no you don't you the body needs food to survive yeah that's what i meant but you are not the body <laughs> swami you're dependent on the next breath of air that you take to your very existence no you're not the body is you're not So this is what Vivekananda calls this indecent clinging to life. It'll, it'll come the moment we think we are the body. Without any doubt, we will cling to life because the body wants to survive. That's the very nature of a biological machine. It wants to continue, and we'll own it. It's my desire. It isn't actually. You have been uh, fooled. You have, what's the word from? You have been had. <laughs> and if you think the body is a trickster, no, it isn't. It's it's a simpleton. its desires and its activities are pretty simple the mind is uh, terrifying it's terrifying hmm. the mind enjoys its madness yeah i was reading this there are um, mental patients you know one reason why they f- they, f- they do resist taking pills is that it seems once you take those pills um the brightness goes out of life it dulls those very faculties which which uh, generate the madness i was reading yesterday so there's this uh, very uh, close to us um, very noted professor of economics uh, kaushik basu professor kaushik basu has written this book reason to be happy it has a double meaning he means that to be happy you should reason also there are reasons to be happy so <laughs> Now he loves game theory. I mean, sort of like I love Advaita. So he loves game theory, and he said that for us the hero, of course, was always John Nash, who was in Princeton here. And uh, he said just recently I read um, that uh, a f- couple of years back, a few years back, that he and his wife John Nash and his wife were killed in a car crash at New Jersey Turnpike. This is such a tragedy for somebody who had gone through so much in life. Um, Most of us we know about John Nash because of a movie Beautiful Mind. Uh-huh. So he was this prodigy who ultimately got the Nobel Prize for economics, but his real contribution was to game theory and mathematics, the what's called the Nash equilibrium. Anyway, to cut a long story short, uh, this professor said, I was reminded of the time I had met John Nash, my hero, you know, at Princeton. So he and another professor were visiting Princeton University, and by that time, um, John Nash had pulled out of the schizophrenia problem quite a bit, and he was mostly uh, all right. So he used to spend uh, hours and hours walking on the lawns, on the grounds of the university. And this professor said, "So he's a legend to us, but people at Princeton had become used to seeing him because he is always around, and we used to watch in awe this." whose subject we were teaching in class the man himself is out there walk pacing the lawns so he said one day i invited him for uh, to have lunch with us in the cafeteria in the university so the great man came and he sat with us with professor basu and another uh, professor 
and uh, we talked not much and a little aside he reveals is another young indian student was there uh, who was passing by and we called him join us he was none other than abhijit banerjee who got the nobel prize just 2 years ago <laughs> he was uh, there that time. he came and he said he came and joined us at the at the table and when we informed he didn't even know who john nash was we informed him who he was it's like an english literature student suddenly was told that the other person third person on the, in the on the table is uh, william shakespeare <laughs> he is he was stunned he <laughs> said look but then he says john nash talked about or wrote actually and meant about his illness he said he did not look upon the treatment as an unmixed blessing he said it's n- coming out of the schizophrenic um, delusion this is according to john nash this is not something you see in the movie he says it's not like recovering from a physical illness mm-hmm. if you recover from a physical illness it's great it's an unmixed blessing you feel much better but he said when you recover from that it's like the spark has gone out of life which is why for some time he refused to take medicines because he prevent prevented him from doing mathematics also the mind loves its madness but one difference i can tell you if we are enlightened you will not feel the spark has gone out of life for the first time you will free what does it feel like it's not like coming out of schizophrenia <laughs> it's rather coming out of uh, shankaracharya says like a, out of a physical illness you feel for the first time endless well being Vivekananda had this discussion with um the great agnostic Robert Ingersoll. Robert Ingersoll said to Vivekananda, I don't believe in your this religion spirituality. I believe in squeezing the orange of life, you know, to the last drop. Vivekananda said I believe that too only in my choice of fruit do I dif- differ. Uh, for me it's a mango. But then he says, imagine if you can that you do not die. Imagine the freedom you have. Imagine that the universe is one with you exactly what we are talking about universe is one with you the joy of knowing that everybody is one with god whatever you experience eh? he says live life in this way and squeeze the orange of your life uh, squeeze the fruit of uh, uh, you know and get every last drop get 10000 fold more so then he says dharma dharma anushthan krit performing um, dharma and adharma moral actions in moral action then what happens you generate karma you do moral actions you generate good karma what is called punya and do immoral actions generate bad karma what is called papa and the result of this punya and papa good karma and bad karma is sukha and dukha pleasure and pain how do you know this is true well, look at our lives pleasure and pain <laughs> what I, you know people think what was i in my past life if it's at all true what was I in my past life don't b- bother just look at your present life it gives you a clue to what you were in your past life <laughs> somebody joked this whole problem with past lives is everybody um, you know says that they 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 were cleopatra or you know julius caesar or something in the past life no we were whatever has generated this life right now so then what happens jayate mriyate cha is born and they die and then they are born again and then and they die again and this is called this chakra the cycle of samsara this is due to ignorance avidwan the ignorant one this is all because of ignorance and if we know what we truly are then what happens dehadi vetirikta atma darshina ragadveshaadi ragadveshaadi prahana apeksha dharma dharma pravritti upashamat muchyante iti those who know the truth that i am not the body not the mind i am this limitless consciousness so i am not born or dying with the body of the mind uh, with the uh, with the uh, body mind i am not dying with bo- being born or dying with the body and i am not transmigrating from life to life with the mind then what happens raga dvesha adi prahana apeksha the strong likes and dislikes this clinging in vivekananda's words much better this indecent clinging to life goes away so are you going to commit suicide no suicide is also indecent clinging to life <laughs> you become quite free of this um, struggle to continue to exist in this way and then this life will become pleasant this life will become 
full of peace, unshakable peace. As long as it lasts, uh, you will. There is a description of the enlightened one, with a slight, not a big laugh, slight smile on your lips. You'll go about the business of life. Uh, and mutchante, so you will not engage in good and bad karma as an agent of karma because you are no longer an agent of karma. You are witness consciousness. You are not an actor in the movie anymore. Even while acting, uh, that the uh, untethered soul, Michael Singer, that example. Now suddenly you know. Yes, here is the world. It's an appearance in me, the consciousness. Here is a body. Here are even thoughts. Good and bad thoughts. They are all appearances in me, the consciousness. None of them are me. Then you do not generate new karma. And once this body particular uh, episode is over, no new episode, no new further seasons in TV series of I, Me, Mine. That's the name of the TV series we are acting out now. <laughs> uh, you are the hero and the villain of your own uh, TV series. You get your, what is it? Emmy, Emmy Award. And then you, you are free. Iti na kenachit pratyakhya tum shakyam nyayataha. Nobody can logically uh, deny this, he says. What he's saying here is interesting. He's saying that we, that, remember his opponents are other philosophies. There are philosophies like the Nyaya philosophy, Vaisheshika philosophy, Sankhya philosophy, which we talked about just now, the Yoga philosophy. Then there is the Purva Mimamsa philosophy, um, the other dualistic schools of Vedanta, the Jaina philosophy, the various schools of Buddhism. Except the materialist Charvakas, all of them more or less agree to this. Shankara says he's playing an interesting game here. In order to defeat the opponent, he's not arguing his own case first. He's f pointing out what you all agree. What you all agree. You all agree that we are going through mm, samsara. Uh, and you all agree it's because of ignorance. Although, as the Swami pointed out to me, the nature of ignorance is different in each philosophy. So you all agree it's due to ignorance. And you all agree when you become enlightened, you become free of samsara. Then nobody can reject this because none of you... That means the other, other opponents who have gathered around to attack him. You all believe this. Okay, so. Then he says, if you do, tatra evam sati. If that's what you believe. Now he's going to what you call lower the hammer on them. Kshetragya se ishwarasya eva sata vidyakrita upadi vedata samsaritvam eva bhavati yatha deha atmatvam atmanaha. In that case, what Krishna said, I, Ishwara God, am this samsari. And because of the upadis, I'll explain that. Because of the body, mind and all of these generated by maya. Samsaritvam iva bhavati. As if you are a samsari. That's what's happening. As if you are a samsari. As if, see, even in Michael Singer's example, when you enter into the world where there are, there's a world and you, are, you have see your own body, you even have thoughts injected into you. Even then you are not in that world. You're the one watching that super movie, that extraordinary movie. Yeah. You're not in there actually. Exactly like that. You are pure consciousness. You are Brahman. Samsaritvam eva bhavati. As if you are a samsari. You are as if in the Matrix movie world. Like a, somebody, when, I, when the Matrix movie was released, somebody told me you should see it. It's a Vedantic movie. <laughs> so, he says, as if um, and that as if is due to ignorance. If you're fully aware of what's going on, you can play your part in that movie without any problem also. You can still go back into the movie. Knowing that it's a movie, it's not a problem anymore. Not knowing it's a movie, you become a samsari. <laughs> the movie becomes your samsara. Especially if even the thoughts are injected by the director. It's terrible then. <laughs> How horrible it will be. But it won't be horrible if you're aware it's being done by the director. Then it can be very scary, but it will still be uh, an aesthetic experience. You see why the doctrine of the falsity of the world, the nature of the world appearance, this doctrine is so important to non-duality. Okay. Sarva jantunam, and then he adds something very cleverly. Yatha dehadhyatmatvam atmanaha. Just as, he says, you are a samsari as if. Just as all sentient beings believe that 
Deha the Atma, that I am the body. Why did he add that? Because that's what all of those philosophies also say. See, th- what he is doing here is, <laughs> he is very skillful, kind of philosophical, you know, jujitsu he is doing. So what he is doing is, he is using the beliefs of those attackers against them. You all believe that all of those philosophies, whether Buddhists or Hindus, whoever, they believe in multiple lifetimes, in karma, people going from lifetime to lifetime, and samsara, and eventual liberation, moksha, uh, nirvana from samsara, even that it's all due to ignorance, and even that release will be due to knowledge, all of that they believe. He's using it against them. He's saying, just as you guys think by mistake, see, everybody thinks we are the body, and that they think according, due to ignorance, because they are not the body. You all agree, right? Because you all agree that all beings are in samsara. They are going from birth to birth to birth. If all beings are going from birth to death and then again birth and another death, in that case they are not the body. Do you see the logic? You cannot be the body. Whichever philosophy you follow, if you are one of those guys who say that there is a samsara, many lives and many deaths, one thing you are implying is the person cannot be the body in that case. Because if the body is dead, in each life the body dies, is gone, then you are gone. You, you cannot go to another life anymore. Only the materialist claims that you are only the body. And nothing more than the body. But the, any religion, any religion believes that you must be something more than the body. Every religion believes that. Without exception. You cannot be a material entity only. And be religious. You can't be. So he's saying... You guys are all, you have your own religions, your philosophies. All of you believe that we, there are many lives, right? In that case, and yet all beings think that they are the body. But in that case, you, you also you, you hold that they're all beings are wrong. You have to say, yeah, beings are wrong. They are not the body, but clearly they think they are the body. Why do they think they are the body? Because of ignorance. Because of ignorance, they superimpose the body upon themselves. So the fact of superimposition, ignorance, its effects, these things is making them accept through their own philosophies. Now you just add a little more to it and bring them to Advaita. Um, and he says, Sarva jantunam hi prasiddha deyadishu anatmasu atma bhava nishchita avidya kritaha In all sentient beings, it is well known, well known to all of you. You all masters of different philosophies, you all agree. They all sentient beings under ignorance, they think that the not self, the body, is the self. They, they think that. People feel that. All sentient beings feel that. Animals feel that. Human beings feel that. And according to you, this why do they feel that? It's because of ignorance. According to you, you all. You all say, you are not the body because you go from lifetime to lifetime. You're going through samsara. Therefore, you can't be the body. Body is dead. So many bodies have come and go. So you could not be the body. You all feel. So why do the people feel that they are the body? It must be only ignorance. So ignorance is causing this, according to you all. You can see them being apprehensive. Yes. Whatever, where are you going with this? You'll see. Then he gives an example. Yatha sthano purusha nishchaya. Just as it's an old example. In a, there's a tree stump in the distance. And it looks like a human being from a distance. And uh, a person coming says, oh, it's a thief. The policeman says it's a thief. It's the lover thinking it's his beloved. So people think different things, but they all think it's a human being. So imagine a dried tree stump with two branches which look like arms in the distance. So he says, that's called sthanu. Sthanu literally means stationary object, a tree stump in this case. So the example is this. Just as in a tree stump people think it's a human being. That does not mean that the properties of a tree stump will become the properties of a human being. Nor will the properties of a human being become the properties of the tree stump. People are sure it's a human being. But that does not mean a human being's property like talking, walking around. Tree stump does not talk or walk around. It will never become the property of a tree stump. Nor will the property of a tree stump become the property of a human being. What's the property of a tree stump? It's stationary. The very word sthanu means stationary. And it's made of wood. It's a dead tree tree trunk. Those are not properties of a human being. So their characteristics will never be the same. 
even though we have mistaken one for the other. All right? This is an example. What are you trying to prove? He says, Tatha, just like that. Na Chaitanya Dharmo Dehasya, Deha Dharmo Va Chaitanya in exactly in the same way, consciousness and body, the, um, the characteristics of consciousness cannot be those of the body. Just as the characteristics of the human being are not characteristics of the tree stump. Like the tree stump, think of the body. Like the human being, think of yourself as consciousness. The characteristics of consciousness are not the characteristics of the body. You see, in this phrase, two words, whole hard problem of consciousness is here. Those of you who have been listening to me will think, oh no, he's going to start with that again. <laughs> now, uh, but that consciousness cannot be reduced to the body. That's the whole issue right now. Mm. Right now, the hot topic. Hard problem of consciousness. All the time. Here he says, consciousness cannot be a characteristic a property of the body or a product of the body, a brain, nervous system, it cannot be. This is the position uh, which uh, a materialist will ref try to refute. And here, uh, if Shankara is saying this, today um, David Chalmers will say yes. Daniel Dennett will say no, vehemently. Mm. This is the debate right now. Mm. Who is there? Uh, Susan Blackmore, Sue Blackmore is a reductionist. Patricia Churchland, reductionist. So they will say no. Someone like Bernardo Castro or uh, Donald Hoffman or David, Ch uh, David Chalmers, they will say, yes, he's right. It is not a product of the body. It's not a property of the body. And the opposite, he says, Deho dharma va chaitanyasya. The properties of the body, the characteristics of the body are not the characteristics of consciousness. Consciousness is not born. Consciousness does not die. Consciousness does not get old. Consciousness is not male or female. Consciousness is not white or black or yellow or brown. Consciousness is not young or old. Sick or dead. No. They are all characteristics of the body. Body, body, body. Now he introduces something interesting. Sukha, dukha, moha, atma, kattva, dihi, atma, na, na, yukta, avidya, kritatva, avishesha, jara, mrityuvat. He says here, not only the characteristics of the body are not characteristics of consciousness, because consciousness and body are distinct, uh, the characteristics of the mind are also not characteristics of consciousness. Thoughts, feelings, emotions, ideas, Pains, pleasures, memories, they are all there in the mind, but they are in the mind, not in consciousness. It is by, just as by ignorance we super identify with the body, similarly by ignorance we identify with the mind. You say, okay, that's, we have been hearing this for years, but see what a terrible problem it creates for the, all the other philosophies. All the other philosophies, almost all of them, they accept a couple of schools of Buddhism. All the others, they say that the body dies at death. It is the mind, you, are the, you and the mind, you are one reality and it goes on to other lives. So you identify what goes on to other lives. The mind. You identify with the mind. And so therefore you become a samsari going from lifetime to lifetime. If you don't identify with the mind, you are not a samsari right now. These other philosophies, Nyaya for example, it says the characteristics of the mind belong to the sel self. They don't make a clear distinction between mind and pure consciousness. And therefore they believe the sentient being goes from lifetime to lifetime. This body is death, you go to another body. That body dies, you go to another body. You go to heaven, you go to hell, you are reborn again. All of this. And finally you will do some kind of spiritual practice in your final birth and attain freedom. This is the story which is told Maybe you'll go to heaven and live with God eternally. This is the story which is told in all dualistic religions. And here he, uh, he attacks that sharply. He says, just like the body is identified with the self out of ignorance, the subtle body, mind too, is identified with the self out of ignorance. Just as height and race and age and disease cannot be characteristics of the self, the characteristics of the body. Similarly, pleasure, pain, memory, personality cannot be characteristics of yourself. 
your real self. They are characteristics of the mind. Body dies, mind goes on to other uh, lives. I agree with you there, but you are not the mind. So you don't go on to other lives. You apparently do. Right. Virtual reality. As if you are a samsari. You are not really a samsari. Once you make this distinction that you are Brahman, it becomes clear to you. You know, when you make the distinction with not only with the body, if you make distinction with the body, all these every religion becomes applicable to you. But if you make a distinction with the mind, then um, Advaita becomes uh, st uh, straightforward, direct. In that case, you are not born. You do not take another birth. You do not go from lifetime to lifetime. Mind goes, but you don't. You are the witness of that also. Not only that, you don't attain to freedom because that witness consciousness is already free. You are not in bondage because the witness consciousness is not going from lifetime to lifetime. It's not a samsari actually. Yeah. You are already free. What will get freedom there? You are already free. Nothing can be done to that. What, why this is an important point is this. It's because all the other philosophies do not sufficiently distinguish self from mind. They will say, yes, we are not the body. The body dies, but the immortal soul, this person goes on to heaven, hell, other bodies. Shankara is saying here, why are you making this uh, distinction between mind and body? Both mind and body are objects. The moment you catch hold of the mind, you'll be dragged from lifetime to lifetime. You'll be a samsari, requiring freedom. And uh, these people will say, no, 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 no. We are not the body, but we are certainly we are the mind. The mind is an integral part of the self. Shankara says, Avisheshat jara amrityuvat. Now he has put them in a corner. Checkmate. Avidya kritatva avisheshat jara amrityuvat. He says, because this identification with the mind is equally a product of ignorance as you have all agreed your identification with the body is. Why? Avisheshat. There is no distinction. The, that which is an object, the body, People are identified, all beings in ignorance are identified with it, think we are the body, we are going to die. And all of us here, all the spiritual masters agree, this is ignorance. Now I am saying the same thing is the case with identification with the mind. There is no distinction. That's a this is an object, the mind is also an object. Because this is an object, you are not it. Because the mind is an object, you are not it. And hence you are free right now. This is the dramatic thing. And he said, this is what Krishna is trying to say when he says to Arjuna, Kshetragyam chapi maam vidhi sarva kshetreshu bharata. And the one consciousness in all fields. All fields means includes body and mind. I'll just end with this. Our real problem, you know, right now, and with the medicine for which is um, um, Advaita Vedanta, is that we are unwilling to Treat the mind as different from ourselves. It's not so difficult to disown, not disown exactly, to treat the body objectively. No one really here says, uh, I am uh, uh, flesh and bones and hair and pus and blood. Nobody says that. They say they are things, often icky things. I can sort of intuitively feel I'm different from them. But this intuitively feeling I'm different from them, this is the mind speaking. It's not so easy to distinguish ourselves from the mind. It's a very subtle thing. And as long as we hold on to the mind, you'll see most, most of our problems are mind. Are mind. All of our problems, almost. Especially spiritual seekers. You know what's the distinction between spiritual and in the path of non-duality in most spiritual paths. Spiritual, worldly people, truly worldly people are concerned with the world. Why did this happen? Why did that not happen? Why did that person say it like that? Why did that person behave like that with me? Do I deserve this? It is so awful. People are, you know, our demand is everybody should be unceasingly, maximally nice to me all the time. We don't say it, sounds crazy, but we are that crazy. So this is a worldly person concerned with the world only. What is the difference between this person and spiritual seeker? Spiritual seeker, the world has faded a little to the background, is more concerned with one's reaction to the world. 
You know, I meditate. I am devoted to God. I practice Vedanta. Why did I get so upset? I'm upset about being upset. I'm upset about my mindfulness, my meditation, my devotion not being effective. You know, uh, the complaint, I try to meditate but my mind is uh, restless. Common complaint for spiritual seekers. And I say that's good. That's a sign of great progress. Not that your mind is restless. That's not great progress. The fact that you have stepped back from worldliness. You're more concerned about the mind, the state of the mind, than about the world itself. Great. Big progress. Hmm? Big progress. Yeah. One step. One step closer inward. One step inward. Big progress. I give the example of Swami uh, Abhayananda in Mayavati Ashram. Uh, you know, faced with a tiger who walked across, the tiger walked across his path one um, afternoon. And his, his reaction was to put his hand in his coat and feel his heartbeat. Has my heartbeat increased? That was his worry. The world is an appearance in consciousness and if the world appears as a tiger, do I take it to be real? If I take it to be real, then I am the body and this is a tiger body, it's going to eat me up. But if I am a witness consciousness in which this monk's body is appearing and the tiger's body is appearing, even if the tiger eats it up, it should be alright. <laughs> Good for the tiger. <laughs> but I should not be alarmed. That was his worry. So you see, how his concern is not with the tiger, not even with his imminent death, but with the heartbeat. Has, has, his, has he become uh, afraid? Even unconsciously. That's, that's difficult. But and, he, and the anecdote goes, he discovered the heartbeat was normal. He felt, oh, good. You can imagine the tiger rolling his eyes and <laughs> and tiger thinking, another non-dualist. <laughs> uh, that's it. Then. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu. Yes. The just hold on for a minute. A couple of comments that uh, Shankaracharya adds: Jara Mrityuvad, just like old age and death. And that's uh, the final clinching move. You just did to see it as like a you know like a chess move. He says, "You are not the mind." You have identified with the mind just as we have identified with the body. Exactly as you have all agreed that birth and old age and death are of the body and all sentient beings say, I'm getting old, I'm, getting, I'm going to die because of ignorance. You agree? Because of ignorance they think that they're getting old. And if they were knowledgeable, they would say, body is getting old, body is going to die, but I'm alright. All of you agree. All the other, you can imagine the other master sitting there. He says, you have agreed to this. Now I'm showing avishesha. There is no distinction between what you have agreed to and my further assertion that the mind is also like that. So our identification with the ups and downs of the mind, with the complexes and guilt and anger and frustration, negativity of the mind, uh, with its projects and fancies, these are also fallacies. These are also based on ignorance just as ig identification with the body is based on ignorance. You all agree. If you said no, then show me the distinction. He's going to draw up a trap. But they are, no, uh, they are, they are professional players also. Uh, so they're going to come up with um, what they see as a huge weakness in his argument. Uh, that, that's for next episode. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll come to you, yes. Just uh, ask a question in the microphone. Maharaj, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. Um, what is the difference between uh, field and prakriti? Same thing. Only thing is, remember, field and nature. Uh, here Krishna says, idam shariram kaunte yakshetram ittyabhidhiyate. This body, O son of Kunti, is to be labeled the field. So it's as if he's saying that it's body only. What about the universe? So, uh, actually what he means is the all of nature, the whole universe, including this body, is the field. However, our identification is with the body, not with the rest of the universe. So, he begins with the body. Uh, he did not say universe is the field. He said body is the field. Uh, you're asking what's the difference between Prakriti and Kshetra. 
uh, in principle no difference but krishna starts because practically the problem our, for our problem we don't identify with all of nature we identify only with this little product of nature that's why he starts there he calls it the field but why what he means by field is everything thank you for this very good talk we heard shankaracharya through you yeah. um, i'm going back to shloka 2 where Sri Krishna says, know me to be in all fields. Yes. He doesn't say, Arjuna, no. you are also in all these fields. Know no. me to be you. He doesn't say that. He said that. So, Shetragyam chapi maam vidhi. He says, know me to be the knower of the field in knower. all fields. Yes. yes. But he doesn't identify or tell, like you often say, know this to be you. Hmm. So isn't this like what Ramanujacharya would say? No. Ramanuja would say... Uh, Vishishta? No. Ramanuja would say that, see, in all bodies and minds, there is the jiva, sentient being. You, the conscious being, you are there. And then Krishna is further back. when I mean, He is Vishnu or Narayana, who is the knower of you also. So, you are there as the jiva, sentient being in that body, experiencing that body, and you are limited to that body. But beyond you, in your heart, is Narayana, Vishnu, Krishna who knows you also as an uh, as an object or as a part of uh, himself uh, but here it's not that notice in the beginning he said you are the knower of the field to arjuna he said you are the your body is the field and you are the knower of the field because anybody who knows the field is the knower of the field who knows this field you know it you are the knower of the field second verse he said i am the knower of the field in all all bodies he doesn't set up that's that's the whole uh, the, no, the, the dramatic statement. He doesn't say, I am your knower. He says, you are the knower of the field. And then he says, I am the knower of the field in all bodies. <laughs> so literally, tattvamasi, uh, I, you are that, that, that identity. Yes. Can you pass the microphone down? Swamiji, the hmm. it's on. The concept of Maya in is it specific to Advaita Vedanta or is it also in Sankhya? No, it's not in Sankhya. In Sankhya is Prakriti, nature. It's uh, almost the same concept. But in uh, Sankhya, these are independent entities interacting. Consciousness and Prakriti. Uh, they don't call it Maya, they call it Prakriti. And um, Prakriti or Pradhana, another name, old name is Pradhana. Um, but in Advaita, the same concept is taken and called Maya. But it's, it is philosophically very different because it's non-different from Brahman. It is the power of Brahman. And it is not as real as Brahman. It's called Anirvachanya. That's what the thing, first thing that the Swami told me this morning from uh, uh, Haridwar. In Advaita Vedanta, the nature of ignorance is it is due to Maya, which is Anirvachanya. And is in uh, Brahm, it, or is appearing in Brahman and makes the universe appear in Brahman. Anirvachanya means you cannot say it is, you cannot say it is not. Like a movie, for example, Harry Potter. Is it or is it not? You can't say it's not. There are so many film reviews being written and what Grammy, uh, not uh, Oscar awards being given. There's one Harry Potter museum also here, I think. So it, it definitely it is something. But can you say it's real like this world? No. So like fiction. It's a category we are familiar with. Fiction, lies, error, dreams. That's at our level. But this, our so-called real world is also like that compared to the reality of Brahman. Yeah. So many <laughs> hands. All right, I'll, we'll go to that lady and the gentleman there, but we'll stop because we are really out of time. Yes. Um, hi, Swamiji. Um, so it... It seems that it's easy to dissociate ourselves from the body because it doesn't get carried over to other lives. Yes. But then um, um, since our subtle body or the mind gets carried over through lifetimes, is it right to say that it's sort of like our individuality that we have to overcome to reach the consciousness? Is that the right, right. way of putting and it? Yes and no. You don't have to overcome the individuality to reach the consciousness. You don't have to reach the consciousness. You are the consciousness. You have to take a stand on it in the sense when you take a stand in the body the world is physical and real to us. When you take a stand in the mind then everything is mind to us. And when you take a stand in consciousness as the witness consciousness you will suddenly see everything is an appearance in that consciousness and is nothing other than that consciousness. Yes, it's a little more difficult because it's constantly with us. 
I mean, the I from your perspective as the conscious being, you can even see the create a little gap psychological gap between yourself and the body because you know in dreams you have a full life in the dream without any reference to the sleeping body then one can imagine how i am not the body i can still exist as a conscious being as, without being the body but it's very difficult to see how you can be a conscious being without the mind also we don't think so because deep sleep where the mind is also not present but we are there but it, we don't seem to think so we think deep sleep is nothing it's like no consciousness but as advaita says it you are fully there in deep sleep just that the body and mind are shut down so yes apply these uh, th- these reasonings these are called prakriya methodologies for example object if it appears to you it's not you do your thoughts appear to you yes do your emotions appear to you appear means do you experience them yes do memories appear to you yes if it changes it's not you so do thoughts change of course understanding memories ideas do they change likes and dislikes of course in that case they are not you they are there but they are not you they don't define you they don't even limit you so in this way distinguish So I am the consciousness but then my mind is a barrier to No, it's not a barrier. It it's just what it is. It's an instrument. Like the physical body is a physical instrument, the mind is a subtle instrument. Without the mind, like without the physical body you can't walk. You can't grasp things. You can't interact with other physical beings. Without a mind you can't think, you can't remember, you can't understand, you cannot uh, feel emotions, intellect, understand. These are all activities which are done with the mind. but they are not you even if suppose you stop thinking for a while you're still there you're just not thinking <laughs> we have become compulsive thinkers because we feel we are the mind therefore if the mind stops we are not there anymore no no we are there very much so it's the mind which is scared of stopping <laughs> so the mind is a, as i say a wonderful servant terrible master it's an instrument learn to regard the mind as an instrument which it is actually create a little gap between yourself and the mind a great freedom will ensue the last person yeah, the gentleman there will end with that pranam swami ji hmm. uh, i think you the the previous answer uh, kind of connects to my question but the question is about anything i'm doing is tinkering with something right yes. i'm the body is sitting here mm-hmm. the mind is trying to understand absolutely what you are saying uh so still i'm tinkering with something that mm-hmm. i think you know that's like it's mine or so uh, and also a lot of the things you said invalidate uh, at least i'm thinking like this right now chitta shuddhi is gone mm-hmm. uh transmutation is gone yes transmigration yeah no let's say you know if if you think about alchemist like there is no going from lead to gold all that is gone uh, so, so i go home and what do i tinker with yes that's notice none of it is gone just by knowing a movie to be a movie does not mean that you have to stop the movie not that you can stop the movie notice even after understanding all of this or even thinking about it you cannot stop any of it it will still go on what we will be free from is grasping a part of the movie and thinking it's ourselves and it's my project that's an let like a ghost in the machine that will be dispelled that's what both advaitins and the buddhists try to do professor j garfield who's a professor of madhyamaka buddhism has written a book losing yourself <laughs> lose yourself to be really free yourself means a small s small self tinkering will go on not tinkering means action action will go on in fact the only philosophy which is not afraid of action which embraces the world as it is is advaita vedanta notice in bhakti in yoga in karma in whatever or in devotion or in bhakti you have to set aside the world which you are facing and try to do something special because this worldly life is not spiritual i must have devotion prayer um, 
you know worship of god that is spiritual that's bhakti that means you are doing something new a new kind of tinkering has to be done not the old worldly tinkering you are rearranging in a new way in um, raja yoga meditation patanjali yoga the tinkering is all in the mind i must shut out this world of tinkering and stop stop tinkering stop it that's uh, yoga sankhya which we discussed now i must see myself as separate from all this tinkering this is prakriti i am the witness of that i am separate it's not me i am not it it's very close to advaita but not advaita still you are trying to do something advaita is the only one uh, which has no acceptance no rejection why because what will you accept and reject it's all literally sim- uh, same without the slightest iota of difference one brahman only and said thasarthas bharpur in hindi they say packed tight with brahman packed tight with god is everything that we see vivekananda said the only thing that we have ever seen is that divinity alone every tinkering is that divinity uh, uh, gita we we do brahma arpanam brahma vi brahma agno brahma nahutam brahme vatena gantavyam brahma karma samadhina brahma so all our activities we do it before food but it basically it's for everything that we do in all action in all in your language in all tinkerings it's only one existence consciousness place you don't have to set up a new kind of tinkering for it it's not gone vivekananda says it's not gone for the first time we have understood it for what it is if that's too difficult then you have to set up a special kind of tinkering called spirituality mm-hmm. it's meditation or devotion or something which is different from all of that mm-hmm. this is that's worldly tinkering this is holy tinkering <laughs> no really this is an in- important insight when we are fools yeah, immature we try to change the world like little children and rearrange the world to suit ourselves we go a little more mature we try to change people realize people are important to us adults spent most of their life trying to change other people <laughs> terrible terrible you are inviting terrible suffering for yourself and you uh, creating suffering for others mm-hmm. try to tinker with people try to change people according to our idea of what it should be then we fail at that become a little more mature then we try to tinker with our own lives oh, all that is useless i must wake up early in the morning do yoga and meditate then i must read the gita i must do th- that is the way to happiness i set up a strict spiritual routine for myself <laughs> then i fail there also <laughs> either i succeed and i don't get that peace <laughs> or i don't succeed <laughs> and then i don't get that peace then i understand it's in the mind then i start to tinker with the mind <laughs> it's actually not in the world it's not in people Uh, it's not in my daily routine also in not even in my life it is my mind which is creating the problem another foolishness uh, i try to know these unholy thoughts i will replace with holy thoughts too much thinking i'll shut down morning and evening in meditation i'm trying to tinker with the mind this i am the this body mind shankar has told me i am witness consciousness i am brahman i am brahman that one i will put in the mind now what the tinkering what will happen again foolishness suffering only spiritual suffering then i've been tinkering with the mind so long nothing is happening no progress people say i'm sorry to say no progress yes you're tinkering with the mind finally we come to knowledge and ignorance no tinkering to vedanta shows us what really is and we are free from it then all the tinkering that will remain as long as this body lives is jivan mukta is for the benefit of others you you have nothing more to gain from it it will go on in its own way you're perfectly fine with it uh, this is the tinkering non duality <laughs> good thank you so much <laughs>